So um, Don, thank you very much. It is, it is an honor to be with you all today and to talk about this idea of how you can be proud of the work that you do, because if you're proud of the work you do, as Don said, you are able to be proud of the company that you work for. And so I want to introduce you to some ideas uh, today that I know will help you feel proud of the work that you do. And I want to start off by asking you, posing a question. I'd like you to ask yourself this, do you agree, do you strongly agree that in order to transform your organization, regardless of the organization that you work for, you need to also transform yourself? So really think about that question. Do you believe, do you agree that to transform your organization, you need to transform yourself? Well, this is a question that was posed by Agon Zender. They asked a thousand CEOs this question. Do you agree that you need to transform your organization to excuse me, transform yourself to transform your organization? Prior to the pandemic, only 28% strongly agreed. Only 28%. But over the course of the last two years, that number has shifted dramatically, where now 80% strongly agree. So 80% of these CEOs now strongly agree that if they want to transform the organization, they need to start by transforming themselves. There's this belief now that has shifted that if you're going to grow your company, you need to start by growing your people. And that begins with growing yourself. This builds really nicely with the work that WorkProud does is if you want your people to be proud of the company that you're working for, you need to be proud of the work that you do. Now, part of the reason I think that we've had this tremendous shift is that one of the things that um, psychologists have found is that whenever there is a period of severe stress, such as a pandemic, what follows is often significant, significant growth, and they call it post-traumatic growth. So there's a sense of, all right, people now agree, if we're gonna grow our company, we need to grow our people, we need to start by growing ourselves. People are ready to grow, but there are some significant obstacles. And that is because your brain has these thick neural pathways, this comfortable routine, this super highway of habits. And so whenever you think about growing, whenever you think about doing something different, it's more like a cow path. And so what can happen is once this webinar is over, if not sooner, your brain will say something like, that was pretty interesting. I, I learned a few things. Um, it was nice to have a break from what I do typically. That cow path was very cute, but it's time to get back on the road. You don't have time to grow yourself, let alone your people. And so then the risk is that nothing changes. Nothing changes. Now it can, of course it can, because we all believe in the growth mindset, but in order for something to change, you need to understand, we need to understand that what got us here, the neural pathways that got us here will not get us there. What got you here won't get you there. And you don't want to walk in circles, which by the way, is a real thing. The Max Planck Institute did a study and they surveyed um, people. Actually, they didn't survey people. They took them into a forest and they said, we want you to walk in a straight line. They didn't give them any landmarks. They just said, rely on your sense of direction. Well, how do you think they did? They all thought that they had done pretty well, but when the GPS data came back, they in fact walked in circles. Circles as tight as 20 meters, or for those of us who like feet, about 60 feet. And so they had this experience of without having any landmarks, without having any indicators, they walked in circles. So you know that you want to grow. You know that you are primed to grow because we're coming out of the pandemic. You know that what got you here won't get you there. You don't want to walk in circles. And so it's going to help if you understand what growth looks like. If you can get smart about growth, if you have a map for what growth looks like, you're going to increase your capacity to grow. And the S curve of learning is that map. Some of you are familiar with the S curve. The S curve was popularized by Everett Rogers back in the 1960s. And he used it to look at how do groups 
change over time. We used it at the Disruptive Innovation Fund that I co-founded with Clayton Christensen at the Harvard Business School to look at how quickly an innovation would be adopted. But as we were using this S-curve to figure out how to, the innovations, when are they going to be adopted to make stock calls, I had this insight, this aha, that the S-curve could help us understand not only how do groups change over time, but how do individuals change? The S-curve could help, help us understand how we learn and how we grow. So every time you're, you're, you, you start something new, your brain is running this predictive model. And it's making lots and lots of predictions, many of which are inaccurate. And so what's happening is that the dopamine in your brain, this chemical messenger of delight, it's dropping, it's de-delighting. And so you're, oh, let me go back up. I, I forgot, I need to tell you what questions it's gonna answer. We'll go back to the S-curve in just a minute. So here's what it's gonna answer for you. It's gonna help you understand why it's hard to start something new. And I started to give you a preview of that already that your dopamine is dropping. It's also going to help you understand why once you do start, it becomes very easy. And it's gonna help you understand why is it that you can be very good at something and feel like you can no longer keep doing it. So these are all questions that the S <laughs> is going to answer. So back to the model, brain running this predictive model, making lots and lots of predictions. What's happening at the launch point of this S curve is that your brain, the predictions are inaccurate. And because they're inaccurate, the dopamine is dropping. <coughs> Excuse me. The other thing that's happening at the launch point is your brain is mapping all of this new territory. And as it's mapping this new territory, literally making memories, it can be cognitively and emotionally very taxing. So you're exhausted. And from an identity perspective, you're no longer who you were and you're not yet who you will be. And so the experience that you're having at the launch point is you can be overwhelmed you can be discouraged, you can be frustrated. Yes, you're thrilled, um, but you have the sense of being gangly and awkward and possibly feel like an imposter. And it's not that growth isn't happening, it's just that it's not yet apparent. And so it feels slow, which is why it can be very difficult to start something new. Now, what does it look like in the sweet spot? Well, your brain is continuing to run that predictive model, continuing to make those predictions, and they're becoming increasingly accurate. And as they become increasingly accurate, the dopamine in your brain is spiking as you're creating these new neural pathways. And from both a mapping out the territory and an identity perspective, you're not yet who you will be, and you haven't figured it out completely, but you have a much greater idea. Still need to be deliberate, but things are starting to put in place, which is why once you do start, things can, can become easy. So the experience that you're having in the sweet spot, the emotional experience that you're having is growth not only is fast, it feels fast. That's the sweet spot. You feel like you're right where you're supposed to be. And so the momentum, it has taken over. That's why it's easy to keep going once you get into the sweet spot. Then you have mastery. So what's happening in mastery? Predictive model, you figured stuff out. The, the model's complete. The, the computer program is debugged, it's working. So there's a little bit of dopamine, but not a lot. From a mapping of the territory, you, you've got this perspective, you've made it up the mountain, you know what you're doing and your identity shift, it's complete. You now are who you were going to be. And so your brain says, hmm, this is really easy. There's nothing new to see here. And in fact, because you're no longer getting dopamine, your brain can say something like, I, I need more dopamine. I'm feeling bored. I need a challenge. And so growth at this point, time can go fast, but growth feels slow, which is why you can have this experience of being very, very good at something and then feel like you can no longer keep doing it. So that's the experience that you have in mastery. And so a very simple way for you to think about this model is slow and then fast and slow 
is what growth looks like. This is how you grow. And by understanding this model, it's going to give you this, this emotional arc. It's going to allow you to trace the emotional arc of growth. So what I'd like you to consider is in your current role, where are you on the S curve? And as you're considering this, as you're thinking about this, I also want you to ask the question, because we're thinking about being proud of your work, where are you on the S curve? And at what place along the curve do you typically feel most proud of the work that you're doing? Do you feel most proud at the launch point? Do you feel most proud in the sweet spot? Do you feel most proud in mastery? So at what point along the curve do you feel most proud? Or let me make this suggestion. If you're able to continually grow, I believe that a peak performer is someone who can navigate every part of that S curve. It's a person who can learn, leap, and repeat. Then you can feel proud of your work at every point along the S curve. So that's something for you to consider. The first thing to consider today is in your current role, where are you on the S curve? I know we're going to take questions at the end, so I do hope that you're thinking of what questions that you, you have and, and would like to pose as we wrap up today. All right, so now that you're thinking about where am I on the S curve, I want you to think about two things. Number one is what does a person need in order to build momentum regardless of where they are on that S curve? And you can think about this from the standpoint of yourself, but you can also think about it from the standpoint of you as a manager. So at the launch point, what do you need? Well, what did we just discuss? We said you feel awkward and gangly and unsure and uncomfortable and impatient. Can't we get this difficult part over with? And so what people need at the launch point is support. Support can look like a lot of different things. The most obvious is that people need training of here's, here's the lay of the land. Here's what you need to know. Maybe there's training around soft skills. Maybe there's training around the domain expertise, but people oftentimes need training at the launch point. And that's one of the things that support looks like. They may also need words of encouragement of here's why I think you can be successful in this role. Here's why I hired you. Here's why I put you in this role so that people can have that script running in their head of, yeah, I can be successful. I, here's what they see. Here's what the top of this mountain looks like. And yes, my manager, yes, my colleagues believe that I will be able to make it up that mountain. Another thing that people need at the launch point is they need feedback. So let me just tell you a quick story of what this can look like. Karen S. Carter works at Dow Chemical, and she had two things happen when she was at the launch point of, of a job, but also of her career. The first was, is when she started, um, she had a boss say to her, obviously she's a woman of color. She had a boss say to her, I want you to know that I see you as being successful. And I want you to make sure that you know that you belong in this role and don't let anybody tell you that you don't. The other thing that this boss did is at the same time that they were saying this to her, they were also not pulling any punches. As Karen describes it, they, they didn't treat her like she was fragile because she was an underrepresented group. They gave her feedback. And if you think about being at the launch point of that curve, you need support in the form of feedback. What is working? What isn't working? Because it gives you something to bump up against. It gives you this ability to course correct. That's one of the things that support looks like is you're able to have the information that you need in order to make progress along the curve. The next thing that people need is for you to value their inexperience. So when someone starts something new, we've discussed there's so much that they're not good at, but the one thing that they're very good at is being inexperienced. And I'm not just talking about a recent college graduate. It could be a brand new CEO. They haven't seen this situation before. And so they're going to have this perspective. They're not blinded by familiarity. Well, they'll say things like, well, why do we do it like this? On your, um, some days you may find yourself saying, just go to your work. And on your not so good days, you might say things, or you might have this feeling of that they're attacking you. Why do you do it like this? And yet, if you can allow them to ask those questions, not only will that open the door to innovation on people and processes and systems um, and, and products, but it also allows them to feel supported because they feel seen, they feel valued, like, yes, 
you have something to contribute to our organization. And so I'd like you to ask yourself the question, who on your team, and maybe it's you, is on the launch point of the S-curve? Maybe it's a colleague. Who is on the launch point and what support do they need from you? If people feel supported, if they feel valued, then they feel proud of the work that they're doing. And if they feel proud of the work that they're doing, they feel proud of the company that they're working for. All right, let's talk about the sweet spot. What did we say about the sweet spot? This is the place where growth is and feels fast. And so what people need is focus. Because if you don't focus, you could quickly crash. You could quickly derail. Focus looks like a lot of different things. One thing that it looks like is because a person's increasingly competent, you're saying, hey, can you take on this? Can you take on that? Can you take on the other thing? And before you know it, they've got 10 projects that they need to do. And we know from project management research, as well as neuroscience research, that people can only do three or four projects, three or four S-curves well at any given time. And so you want to give them permission to prioritize, permission to say no to you, permission to say, hey, we've got these 10 things that you want me to do, but here's how I think we probably want to prioritize them. What do you think? So you want to give people this ability to focus and that starts with permission to say no. The other thing that you want to do is really focus on what is working. I want you to take a look at this picture for just a minute. All of you, probably all of you know Kobe Bryant who died at far too young of an age. And it's very easy for our brains to immediately go to Kobe Bryant. But the person I want you to focus on this picture is not him. I want you to focus on the person whose face you can't see. His name is Shane Battier. Um, there are lots of shots of the back of his head and, and Michael Lewis who wrote The Blind Side called him um, the no stats all-star because no one, he was an all-star but no one knew exactly what he did. Except that when he was on the court, his opponents like Kobe Bryant got worse and his teammates got better. And so they called him Lego because things seemed to magically work when Shane Battier was on the court. And so the second thing I want you to think about from a focus perspective is as things on your team are working well, pay attention to why are they working well? Who's making them work well? And then you want to acknowledge the work that they're doing. People in the sweet spot, people who are doing really good work, people who are going fast, um, sometimes they're not the problem child. In fact, they're not. Um, and so you don't wanna make them one by ignoring them. To summarize around this is, um, we know from the neuroscience is that when you notice whatever you pay attention to, you get more of. And so if you're focusing on, I need to get out of debt, then you're gonna get more debt. But if you say, I'm focusing on building wealth, you're gonna get build wealth. Same with people on your team. If you focus on what isn't working, you're gonna get more of that. If you focus on what is working, you'll get more of that. And that, that begins with your people. Of course, at this point, you know, if people are doing really good work, it, it, it feels fast, they're going fast, um, they're going to feel proud of the work that they're doing. And you're going to feel proud of the work that they're doing. So the question for you here is who is in the sweet spot and how will you help them focus and how will you focus on them so that they can continue to grow? Mastery. This is the top of the mountain. And what did we say here? This is that place where people have figured things out. And unlike the um, sweet spot where growth feels fast, where your dopamine is spiking, the dopamine is flatlining and people now need more dopamine. What they need is they need a challenge. They need this opportunity to continue to grow so that they don't stagnate. And, and Mountain, uh, actually, before I go there, I want to share a quick story with you, what, what this can look like. So um, uh, Patrick Bichette, he was the CFO at Google. But here's what happened when he was first hired. He had already been a CFO before. He'd been in operations for a while. And so it, there was the risk, because he was already very much in mastery, that he would come in and he would do the job for 18 months, if that, and be bored at the top of his curve. And so he would potentially leave. And so the conversation he had with Eric Schmidt, who was the CEO of the time, was this. Patrick, I want to retain you. So here's what we're going to do. Whenever you start to feel bored, whenever you start to feel like you're at the top of your curve, that's my language, not his. I want you to come to me and say, hey, I need something new. So we did that. 
So he started out as CFO, but then over time he added on things like people, Google Fiber, real estate, um, their nonprofit arm. And that allowed him, because he continually got to the top of the curve, moved to the bottom of a new curve, that allowed him to stay in the same role at Google for seven years. And as you see here, he says, I'm forever grateful for Eric Schmidt. He's a great mentor. All right, so now what I was gonna tell you is that mountain climbers um, will say that any altitude above 26,000 feet is known as the death zone. They're so high up, um, there's not enough oxygen, so their brain and body will start to die. And the same is also true for people who are at the top of their S curves. If they're not learning, if they're getting bored, they're not going to be motivated. And because they're not learning, there's no new neural pathways that we talked about earlier. With no new neural pathways, no, no opportunity to acquire some stress and be challenged, their brain and their body will literally start to die because learning is the oxygen of human growth. So I'd like you to consider who on your team who of your colleagues, possibly you, is in mastery? And do they need an additional challenge? Do they need an opportunity to continue to grow so that they feel this pride in the work that they're doing and can continue to feel pride in your company, in your organization? Next thing I'd like you to consider is where is your team and or, and or your colleagues generally on the S curve? Where is your team on the S curve? So you can have individuals and where are they, but where is your team overall? Is your team in terms of how it works together, in terms of how, you, your, how cohesive you are? Are you as a team on the launch point? Are you as the team in the sweet spot? Are you as a team in mastery? Which leads me to this next idea, which I've kind of alluded to, the notion that your career is a portfolio of S-curves. Um, in any given role, you're not on just one S-curve at, at, at right now. You're probably on multiple S-curves. The same goes for your team, is your team is a portfolio of S-curves. There, where you can think about how do I optimize um, our team for growth? And then your organization as well is a portfolio of S-curves. And as a starting point, as you're thinking about optimizing for growth, you want to have roughly 60% of your people in the sweet spot, 20% um, in, in the launch point, and 20% in mastery. Why? Because when you've got people in the launch point, as I said earlier, they ask questions like, why do we do it like this? They, they bring this fresh perspective. And there's some great work on this idea in the book range that, that David Epstein wrote is this notion of, let's look at this from a new perspective. That opens the door to innovation. You want that perspective on your team. At the same time, you probably don't want more than 20% depending on the project that you're working on, because there is training that was required. It requires resources to move people off the launch point. Um, in, in, in the sweet spot, what happens is that people know enough to, to really be competent in that sense of autonomy and they're growing quickly. Um, and so they can answer questions, but they're still not up the mountain completely. So they're still asking, why do we do it like this? You also want people in mastery. Why? Because they have that institutional memory. They're, they, well, on the one hand, they do need a new challenge, but on the other hand, they can help people understand here is why we're doing it like this. It gives people something to bump up against. And of course, they can do these S-curve loops and bring other people along. But this is a starting point for you to think about how can I not only optimize my career, because if you think about your career, if you're on the, or your life, I should say, if, you, if you're on the launch point, you just got married or you just had a baby and you've got a brand new role, you're on the launch point in every single curve of your life, that means you're probably going to need some extra support. And so you can think about this from the perspective of your life. You can think about this from the perspective of your current role. Do you have a portfolio of curves where some are in the sweet spot, some are at the launch point, some are in mastery? And you can think about this as a way to optimize innovation inside of your organization by having this diversity of where people are in their growth. Now, let me give you a quick example of how you can have a conversation around this, and then we'll, we'll move to a little bit more tactical of what to do next. 
So there's a company called Chatbooks, you might be familiar with them, where they turn Instagram photos into photo books. And this is a company that's been around for about seven years. The culture is a really good culture. People like to work there. And so the CEO was concerned that he had a number of people who were already in mastery on their curve. And so um, the CEO, Nate and Vanessa Quigley, they're entrepreneurs. They have you know, seven children. In fact, that's how the company started is because she noticed that their youngest didn't have any scrapbooks because she has seven children. And so by making this easy to turn this Instagram photos into photo books, this is this was the genesis of the company. But they brought us in and said, hey, can you help us figure out where our people are in their growth? And sure enough, what they found is that three out of four of their senior leaders were in mastery along the curve. And so that, though, allowed us to have these conversations to figure out what are you going to do next? Because when you know where people are, you know what's next. Three quick conversations. Well, they weren't quick. Three conversations took place. I'll talk about them quickly. First conversation looked like this. Chief marketing officer was able to say, oh, now I understand. It's not that I don't like chat books. It's not that I don't like my manager. It's just that I'm no longer growing. I'm at the top of my S curve. And by having this artifact, this way to talk about it that wasn't personal, it allowed for her actually to go jump to a new curve at a new company, but it was amicable because it wasn't personal. It was just, we need to continue to grow. There's not a way to grow here. And so we're gonna give you an opportunity to grow elsewhere. Second conversation that took place was with the president. He said, hmm, I'm showing up in mastery, but I've only been in this role for a year and I've never been a president before. Well, what they discovered is that the CEO, he had delegated these responsibilities to the president, but he was still on the president's curve. So the president's saying, hey, the mountaintop isn't 20,000 feet. It feels like it's 10,000 feet because I'm not yet able to do my job because I've got this person still on my curve. This led to a conversation about roles and responsibilities. The CEO properly moved to his new curve. And so now the president had enough headway that allowed him to be in the sweet spot, not in mastery. Third conversation that took place, CTO, he was taking on new roles, putting some, not new roles, excuse me, new projects that put him at the launch point of the curve. It allowed him to say, you know what, this is really uncomfortable. I feel awkward. I know I'm supposed to be the expert, but I'm doing this new thing. So it gave them this language, this way to normalize the experience that he was having, and also to normalize the experience of being new across his organization. And also to understand this is what's happening. It's not that I won't be good at it, and, and maybe he won't, but I'm still at the launch point. I don't have enough information to know if I'm going to be able to do this successfully. Now, one other thing that I, I want to mention very briefly is if you think about this idea of the S curve is a mountain and you're at the launch point and then you move from the sweet spot into mastery, you also want to consider the fact that you climb a mountain, you climb an S curve by yourself, but you don't do it alone. There are weather patterns and it's gonna be a lot easier to do it if it's sunny and 60 or 50 degrees than if it's snowing. And so as you consider this ecosystem and you consider, is it possible, are other people around me making it possible for me to move up the curve? I want you to consider that you as a colleague, you as a manager are creating the ecosystem wherein people around you can grow. You are the keystone species, if you will, as a manager. And I love this quote. This, this is from Tom Rath, who wrote um, Strengths Finders. And he said, contribution is the sum of what grows when you are gone. You can think about this in terms of your current role, a current project, but you can also think about this in, in terms of your career and even in terms of your life. All right, so three things to remember as we wrap up and then move to our Q&A. As you are at the launch point of a curve, and, and after we finish this, this, this workshop, this webinar today, you are in effect at the launch point of the curve. And so three things I want you to remember. Number one is that slow, fast, slow is how you grow. You now have this, this simple visual reminder of the emotional arc of what growth looks like. 
Second thing I want you to remember is the importance of dopamine. So when you're at the launch point, what did we say? You're not getting very much dopamine. In fact, it's dropping. But once you know that if you can beat expectations, because that's when you get that dopamine, once you know that, then you can harness the power of dopamine by at the launch point setting small, ridiculously small goals. You may be familiar with James Clear. We had him on our podcast a few years ago, and he talked about this idea of setting such small goals that in fact, if you set those small goals, it's very easy to beat them. And it can be something as simple as, okay, I want to start exercising. Well, I'm not going to plan on exercising 30 minutes a day. If I don't exercise at all right now, my ridiculously small goal might be, I'm going to put on my tennis shoes every day for the next week. And that will start to create that cow path in your brain that over time can move into the thick neural pathway. So here are some small goals that you might set as you're coming through the conversation that we're having today. You can plot each team member on their learning curve. You can provide encouragement to a launch point or just send them a quick text. Here's why you're in this role. I think you can do a great job. Send a text of appreciation to a sweet spotter. Talk to a master about a new challenge. Just, hey, how are you doing? Do you feel challenged? Do you need something new so that you can continue to stay engaged, so you can continue to feel proud of the work that you're doing? Or start a conversation about a new S-curve with them, because sometimes that's appropriate. Or talk to your manager or team about where you are on your S-curve. All right, so that's number two, ridiculously small goals. And then number three is to build in accountability. Say what you'll do by when. And this, um, I think, is so powerful. And I hope that you're thinking about this as we come through um, to the end of our time together is if you have an idea or goal as you're listening to this thinking, oh, that's a great idea. There's only a 10 percent chance you'll do it. If you consciously decide you'll do it. Twenty five percent chance. Decide when you'll do it. It goes up to 40 percent. So I'm going to do it by next week. If you commit to someone, you'll do it. Um, I say to you, Don, hey, I'm going to do this. Um, it's a 65% chance. But if I say to Dawn, hey, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to put my tennis shoes on every day. I'm going to plot where my team is on the S curve by next week at this time. There's a 95% chance that I will do it. So you want to say what you'll do by when to someone. As my editor's husband's former boss um, cheekily said, if you want to be a star, do what you say you'll do because almost no one does. So supposed to feel uncomfortable at the launch point, you're, you're, you're on that cow path, you set small goals and you say what you're going to do by when to someone. So what I'd like you to consider is what's your ridiculously small goal? What is it? I hope that you'll write it down. I hope that you'll send someone a text right now and ask them to hold you accountable and that you're going to do it by a certain date so that you can build that cow path. So you feel like, okay, this time that I just spent this was useful. This was worthwhile. This gave me information that will allow me to continue to grow, that will allow me to feel like I'm proud of the work that I'm doing, that will allow me to grow my team and, and, and then to grow my company. All right, a few final thoughts before I turn it back over to Dawn. There's been a lot of discussion about the great resignation and many, many different names, the great reset, et cetera. I would submit to you, as you consider the experience that each one of us have had over the past two years, and we talked about post-traumatic growth, we have discovered that we're more capable, we're more resilient than we, we thought possible. And so as you are a person who's thinking about talent, thinking about people on your team, think about that, because that then would suggest that people are not resigning from they're discovering I want more and I can have more because I've discovered that I'm capable of having more. Consider the possibility that what this really is, it's the great aspiration. People want more and they've discovered that they're capable of more. And if you can create those conditions, those weather patterns where people can have more, where they can grow, where they can feel proud of the work that they are doing, then you are going to be able to retain and recruit, and recruit people for your organization. All right, so one final story. I formerly, as Don said, was an equity analyst. And when I first started as an analyst, I had just built my financial model and it was time for me to go public with my very first stock recommendation. The numbers looked good, the, 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 the prospects for the company looked good, but the stock was up a lot. 
And so I was very concerned about putting a buy on the stock. Cause what if I put a buy on the stock and the stock goes down immediately? So I say to my boss, hey, what if we put a neutral on the stock? Which for those of you who follow the stock market at all, know that a neutral isn't really a stock call. It, it means don't buy it, don't sell it. So one colleague called me a shrinking violet, which I own, but then my manager was a little bit more gentle and said, I want you to think about this. Why wouldn't it keep going up? It has good momentum. Is it possible that it can continue to go up? Well, fortunately, I put a buy on the stock and fortunately the stock continued to go up. But as I have considered that question, this has been two decades ago now, as I consider that question of why wouldn't it keep going up? It led to a much deeper question, which is, do I believe that we as people can continue to go up? Do I believe that we can continue to grow? Well, as I said, it's been 20 years and my answer is a definitive yes. Growth is our default setting. We are wired to grow. Human growth is unbounded. And the more we grow, the more we can grow. So grow yourself, to grow your people, to grow your company. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dawn, for us to go into the Q&A. Great, thank you. Yes, so if anyone has any questions, please feel free to submit them. We had some pre-questions, so I'll start with those. But I wanna give you a personal thank you because not too long ago, I recently disrupted myself intentionally found myself at the launch point, but not, you forget about these things and not having, you know, read your book and so forth, feeling those things, they're real, the frustration. And, you know, after a long time of being a mastery, when you do that to yourself, you forget what that's like to start over. So I certainly appreciate those insights. And I'm glad to know that everything I was going through was perfectly normal. But I want to start with a question because you really made me tie some things to my experiences over the years as either being a leader or watching other leaders manage their team mm. as it relates to the S curve. Because if you're not mindful of those stages and you have your launch point team and your sweet spot team and you have your mastery team and you're treating them much the same way. So your launch, your launch team, you get frustrated because, well, why aren't you working as fast as your peer? And why are you not getting this? And this seems so simple. This seems common sense. So then you kind of lose focus on them and you go to your sweet spot. I'm like, well, I know you can do it. You're eager. You always, you turn this around. And like you said, you over leverage them. You give them too much. They become burned out. And then your mastery, sometimes I've seen leaders, you kind of forget about them. They're on autopilot. They don't really need a lot of support. You're not mindful of the cha new challenges they need. And therefore you risk losing all of them to turnover because the one doesn't feel supported, the other's being over, -led, uh, over leveraged and the masteries are forgotten. W would you agree with that? Oh, Dawn, that's a really, really terrific summary. I love that. So the launch pointers don't feel supported, the sweet spotters feel over leveraged and the, um, the people in mastery feel forgotten. It's really a beautiful summation. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Well, no, it just all came together. But that said, so I, I, you know, as a leader, how do you keep this front of mind? What tools can you use? Because you said it yourself, like you may have a day where you forget and you're just like, just do it and you move on and the business needs are there and you need to be driving revenue and all those things you have to do within a company that may take you away of keeping the S curve top of mind so that you're managing your team appropriately. Are there yeah. any little tools that you can recommend? Yeah, so, um, so yes, obviously we have a tool that people can use and, and that's available to you. But I, I think at a, as a starting point is you can just have this S and, and what I love about this is because it is so simple and it's so visual, it's easy to remember. And if you can also consider the fact is, is if you can say to yourself, all right, and this is something that we do continually is we just say to ourselves, where is our, where, where's this person on the S curve? What do they need from us? Where's, a, where's our team on the S curve? 
curve. And then remembering that if we can think about where our organization is on the S curve, if we've got our entire organization, for example, on the launch point of the S curve, we're going to have a lot of people with a lot of ideas about things that we could do differently and no one capable of executing them. Or we're going to have people who are in mastery, lots of people who are capable of executing them, but maybe not a lot of ideas and people who are actually tired of doing the work that they're doing. And so if you can use this as a way to have conversations about growth and continually just think, okay, where am I? Where are my people? Where's my team? And recognizing that when you know that, that's going to help you have the outcome of the revenue and the growth that you're looking for as an organization, that makes it easy to keep it top of mind, especially again, because it's so simple and it's so visual. Absolutely. And kind of another avenue, do you, is there any correlation to your S-curve to being applied to projects and with project management. So not so much people, but in the stage of a project. Mm. You know, that's a great question. And I love that you asked that. And I don't know if you, you, you know this already, but um, I actually had um, on my podcast a few years ago, a fellow by the name of Antonio Nieto Rodriguez. And he is a pro he wrote a book called The Project Revolution, I think it's called, if people want to listen to this. And we have this whole back and forth around using this for projects. And yes, you can apply it. And, and here's, here's how I would talk about it briefly. Sometimes um, when something is at the launch point of an S-curve, because you've got lots and lots of ideas, and we know from the theory of, of disruption that you're, you know, generally, you're not going to adopt all these ideas. You've got to explore. You've got to decide if you want to pursue them. And so when you're at that launch point of the curve, you've got lots of ideas and we do ourselves an injustice if we call an idea a project prematurely so you want to make sure that you allow these ideas you can incubate incubate them before you make the decision that it becomes a project because once it becomes a project then you start to go into this place of how do we scale this you move away from the creativity to now it's time to execute and once you make that decision then you can focus on how do we execute this and that's when you you flip that switch, you can move into the sweet spot of scaling it. And then when you get to mastery, well, what does it mean? It basically means the project's finished. And we've all seen these, ex had these experiences where the project's finished, it worked really well. And we say, let's all, let's all keep talking about this and focusing on it. But we can't because it's, it, it's done. We're at the top of the mountain. And, and when you get to the top of the mountain, it's important for you to understand that you need to celebrate it. We did this take it in, survey it, honor it, but celebration means by definition, you're marking the beginning of something new, you're marking the end of something else, it's time to climb a new curve. So yes, you can absolutely apply this to project management. Thank you. Another thing you mentioned are setting small goals, hmm. which here again, that, that sounds easy, but how do you prevent yourself from setting a realistic small goal? Because you may think it's small, but it's not. And therefore you put yourself in this position of a goal that's that's too much and might send you back down the curve. Yeah, so Don, that is such a great question. And it's, if we were all having a conversation live with each other and I was like live coaching you, probably at least 50% of you, the goals at least would be too big <laughs> because we think I'm gonna do this big thing. But if you try to do this big thing, then it gets crowded out. So the way that you can think about a ridiculously small goal is this. What is something that you could do in two minutes or less, two minutes or less. And more specifically, if you set that goal for yourself and it gets to be 11 o'clock at night and you haven't done it yet, you'll still do it because you want to keep that winning streak going. And so that's how, you know, if it's small enough, if it's concrete enough, you can describe it and then you would do it if it were still 11, if it were 11 o'clock at night and you hadn't done it yet because it was so ridiculous. Well, of course I can spend another minute to get that thing done. That's a way for you to think about getting it small enough so that it's actually doable. So that you can get that dopamine, exceed expectations, build momentum off the launch point that kicks you into this, the tipping point and the sweet spot of the curve. Makes total sense. Well, I don't. So we had a question from David Anderson, and I'm just going to shout out to you, David. If I don't 
pose this correctly, please add clarification. But he put in a question at the beginning, and I believe it was around your perspective at the beginning with your green and gray chart. And he says, oh, yeah. wouldn't the same be said that a CEO's beliefs, values, vision should already be present within the CEO before joining an organization? Not exactly sure what you meant by your first question that showed the changes in CEOs pre and post COVID. Oh, okay. Yeah, so so here here's what the, the, the data said is that they had asked them that question and um, they, you know, do you strongly agree that this transformation of the organization needs to be accompanied by a transformation by yourself? Um, and so I, I don't know to the mindset, but what I would say is that the given, so I'm just analyzing the data, given that there was a big shift between the pre and post COVID, it would suggest to me that there was a disruption of mindset that took place over those two years. This realization that if in fact they were going to take their company forward, there it would precipitate and require that they think differently, that they think about how they're approaching the business and what are you doing differently and how do you lead by example? Because if you will lead by example, then that will allow other people to change as well. I just had this actually conversation not too long ago where um, we're, you know, we're working with a company and they um, have a number of the senior leaders getting coached. All of our coaches are coaching them. And um, the, one of the senior leaders, the, the chairman said, I don't want to be coached. And one of the questions that's coming up from kind of bubbling up is people are saying, well, why don't they want to be coached? Like there's this feeling of like, there's something wrong with us. We need to change, but you, you don't need to change. So this sense of we need to see you wanting to change as well and leading by example. So that's, that's, that's the data. That's how I look at it. And I hope that gives you a little bit of additional perspective. Absolutely. Well, I don't see any other questions. So I really want to thank you again, Whitney. I think you're insights were spot on, certainly very relevant to growth and where it starts and how you're growing and, and knowing where you are in your growth. And if you're not growing, then you need to kind of reevaluate and figure out how you're going to start growing so that we continue to, you know, drive pride as we tie it back um, and, and feeling pride in your company. So thank you very much. I want to let remind everyone about the free book. And I, I think I saw a question. We will be sending out a form. So if you didn't register for that information, it's not too late to get your free book. Love to give you a heads up about our next webinar, which will be um, Chris Bailey. It will be on um, August 24th, same time as today. So 12 central, and it's around intentional productivity. I think we all can say we'd love to be more productive. So hopefully you all turn tune in for that. And if I don't see any other questions, I thank you. The, thank you to the audience and everyone here at work proud hopes that you are proud in what you do and proud of your company. Thank you.